morning, everybody. Um, sorry, it's necessary. Um, first of all, I just want to say it's um, it's really I'm so freaking tickled to be here. Um, first of all, I I love hearing everybody's stories, and um, you have inspired so much conversation about libraries. I think it's one of the, the easiest, most joyful things to talk about lately. Um, but it's so nice to hear from all of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to, um, to share this day with you. It gives me great joy to be in a room with people who I believe occupy a most important space and position that for so many is our North Star, our beacon, a home in communities large and small across the country. So it is therefore my great honor to speak to you today. For a better part of my life, from the time I was a reader, I have felt and known the incomparable power of great stories to transport us, as Elliot just shared, from our own immediate reality and to connect us intimately with other lives and other worlds. I have been an avid reader all my life. And like so many of you, I find opportunity, even if brief, to be back in a book. When I was a child, my mother implemented a rule to never leave home without a book in your hand. It is a habit I joyfully maintain. The library in my home community, in my hometown of Clifton, um, it's called the Clifton Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio, was a haven where I would lose myself in books, a place that lit up my imagination and expanded my understanding of the world. As one of six children at that time, it was solitude, it was quiet, a space to myself, an escape from chaos. Like for many millions who now re rely upon their libraries and were fortunately introduced to a library's singular shelter, it was there that I first discovered and devoured books that I have gone on to read to my own children and where I still return often to discover new treasures and revisit old favorites. My current branch is the Jefferson Public Library in the West Village, formerly a prison. <laughs> Public libraries are, for me, a vital part of our society and functioning democracy as a resource for people of any age or background to find what they need to help improve their quality of life. They are at the very heart of our communities. They are cool in the summer and warm in the winter, and for so many, the gateway to possibility, information, and a better understanding of not only who they are, but what they can become. Therefore, it has been a tremendous privilege for me to act as the honorary chair of the ALA's Book Club Central, sharing books that I love with readers across the country, and perhaps most importantly, to introduce and remind readers of the extraordinary gifts that are our public libraries and celebrate our librarians who welcome us and shepherd us. We must continue to push for funding and stand alongside the ALA to support all of its efforts to help those of you who so nobly serve. So I want to thank you, like so many, else, every, like everybody else today, um, for the important work that you do. It's meant a great deal to me personally. And as well, if I can just take a moment to say, on behalf of my mother, who is eventually the mother of eight children, um, who began the relationship with libraries for all of her children, and who makes her Teaneck Library branch a sort of second home, I believe there is no greater association in her estimation than the one that I have with the ALA and United for Libraries. And I also want to thank Skip Dye, who is enormously inspiration and great inspiration to me, and I know is um, a big part of your life. So where, I think he's here. Where is he? Yeah. That is a man on a mission. I love him. And I'm so happy to stand shoulder to shoulder and, and do what, basically whatever you ask of me. Um, and now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you another book and author who I hope you will all read and embrace with the same affection and excitement I have because Claire Adam, whose debut novel, Golden Child, is the second title on the SJP for Hobart list. 
This story, Golden Child, is a perfect example of what I imagined and what I hoped my imprint would champion. The kind of book that brings otherwise faraway places into clear focus, illuminating with resounding empathy and humanity all the messes and losses and loves of, other li of others' lives. Though this novel is set in Trinidad, an isolated country I've never been to, the characters Claire has crafted and the urgency with which she brings Trinidad to life makes this story and its setting, which is a character itself at times, widely and wonderfully known. In Adam's spare, elegant prose, this land and these people come to feel real, immediate, and achingly familiar. Golden Child is the story of a family quietly surviving and struggling to succeed against the beautiful but precarious backdrop of rural Trinidad. Clyde is a father determined to raise his teenage sons well. Though his twins could not be more different, Peter is very promising with a bright future ahead of him, while Paul is somewhat slow and strange and needs a little help. When one of his sons is kidnapped, Clyde finds himself all alone, up against forces terribly beyond his control, and faced with choices that no parent should ever have to make for their child's future. And ultimately, this becomes a human story about aspiration, betrayal, and sacrifice. With unerring insight, Claire Adam ac accesses the deepest fears of having and belonging to a family, all of the dread a parent carries that often goes unspoken. And in the same way, the Trinidadian landscape is in turns lovely and treacherous. Golden Child is a book that is both gorgeous and unsettling achieving the kind of emotional impact that we look for in our most beloved novels. It was so obvious to me from the early pages that I was in the hands of an incredible talent and a beautifully gifted storyteller. Claire Adam has given us an important and unforgettable, unforgettable story, and I could, be, I could not be more thrilled to be with her today and to introduce to you Claire Adam. everybody. Can everybody hear me at the back? Thank you for that lovely introduction. This is just, this is so emotional for me. I think like you, I have to sort of be careful just to sort of keep myself together and not well up. So, you know, I was, I sort of spent five years writing this book and, you know, most of the time I'm sort of alone at home in my pajamas writing this book and now it's all finished and now I'm here and I'm talking to all of you and like it's a really, it's a big shock for me. So <laughs> try and bear with me. Um, so I grew up in Trinidad, but I live in London now, um, and I'm very fortunate in London to have lots of public libraries on our doorstep, and we go there regularly. I have kids, and we go to the library like every week. Um, but when I was preparing for this talk, I was sort of thinking back to my time in Trinidad, and I actually couldn't remember going to libraries. And so I did what many people do when they're kind of in a stuck kind of situation. I called up my mother, and I was like, you know, mommy, I was like, did we have libraries in Trinidad? Because I just don't remember them. And she was like, yes, yes, we did. And, um, and she sort of started talking about all the libraries that she had been to. And she said she used to drop us at school and then she would go to these libraries and she talked about four or five libraries. <laughs> Get away from us. <laughs> and she talked about these sort of four or five libraries. They're kind of quite specialist libraries. They're quite small and often kind of underfunded. Um, but she went there and she would spend the day there and then she would come and pick us up at three o'clock. And she was sort of talking and talking and I'm like, okay, yes, well, this is very good, but you know, I'm supposed to be talking about me here. <laughs> and, um, and she was like, okay. And she said, but she wanted to tell you that all the librarians from Trinidad were very knowledgeable and very helpful. <laughs> and, um, and she said, in her opinion, all librarians are nice people. So there you go. It's official. <laughs> So let me just go back and tell you a little bit more about me. So I'm, I was born in Trinidad and I grew up in Trinidad. I lived there until I was 18. Um, so I'm the youngest of four children. Um, my father is Trinidadian. And I'll just explain because it's not, not everybody knows. So our sort of history in Trinidad is a little bit interesting. So our ethnic mix is quite, we've got about 50, 50 black and Indian. So um, what happened was, of course, in colonial times, so British, um, Trinidad was uh, you know, a British colony. 
and um, Africans, of course, came over as slaves, as you know, and then when slavery was abolished, then Indians were brought over as indentured laborers. So my father actually is, um, is um, Indian, but he has never been to India. He doesn't know anything about India. He has, you know, doesn't know anybody there. So he is really just Trinidadian. So, and my mother, meanwhile, is Irish. And, um, and they met because they were both doctors and they were working at a hospital in England. And they met and got married and came back to Trinidad and had all of us. Um, so my mother, she stopped practicing medicine soon after we were born. There were four children, so you know she kind of had her hands full. Um, but she was one of those people who was very busy and always doing lots of projects, always had lots of things on the go. And one of the things she did was she started a little library in our primary school. And I have to kind of go back and explain that, like, Trinidad at this time, I mean, people were talking about the difficulty of getting books, but I can trump you <laughs> because, <laughs> because Trinidad at the time, like, we were, you know, we're a little tropical island. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, it was, it was really not easy to get books back then. And, you know, we had one TV channel. We had, like, a couple of international flights a week. There really, there was, you know, there were books. There were some bookstores, but it was a very limited stock. And, like, even if, say you were to get hold of a publisher's catalog and say you were to fill it out, and, you know, you might have to take the morning off to go to the bank and get, like, your foreign exchange, and then you would go and you send this off, and you'd go through all this effort, and you would, you know, in all probability, the books would just never arrive because the postal service was just very unreliable. Um, so what my mother did when she started this library was she went around and she gathered all these books that, that were in people's homes, and the children had grown up and they were, you know, they were finished with them. And she rounded them all up, and um, she got them all catalogued with the Dewey Decimal System. That was my first experience with the Dewey Decimal So this was wonderful, because it meant, you know, we always had plenty to read. And, you know, most importantly, you know, we got to be on library duty at lunchtime. We got to stamp the cards. <laughs> and we got to wear the librarian pin, you know. So <laughs> this was all very exciting. So now Trinidad, of course, in many ways, was a wonderful place to grow up. You know, I feel very privileged to have grown up there. You know, so, I mean, people are very friendly. The food is very good. Should you ever go to Trinidad, you must check that out. Um, and, you know, it's a tropical landscape, and it's very beautiful. So that is lovely. But, you know, despite the fact that we were having this lovely childhood with lots of books and, you know, plenty of space to play and so on, there was in the background going on, like, my parents were sort of engineering this master plan to get us out of Trinidad. And, you know, this wasn't just confined to our family. This was sort of a general thing that was happening in Trinidad at the time. And I didn't really understand it while I was living there. But, I mean, how it is is that in Trinidad, we have oil and natural gas. And so our economy is very tied to the price of oil. And so what happened was, so in the sort of late 70s and early 80s, the price of oil was high. And things were good. So we had plenty of money in the country. Everybody driving Mercedes Benz, people taking trips to Miami. Things were very good. Money was flowing. But then, like, in the early 80s, sort of mid-80s, then the price of oil went down. And so in Trinidad, there was problems. So things kind of took a turn for the worse in Trinidad. So a lot of people were trying to emigrate at that time. And it was happening in my family, too. So my parents were very determined just to get us out. And I mean, different families had different strategies. But in our family, the strategy was to get us to university abroad. And my parents were like, um, these Ivy League schools look quite good. What about those? <laughs> and then they saw the fees and they were like, hmm. Like, OK, you all had better work on getting some scholarships to those schools. <laughs> so this was the master plan. Like, you know, I lived in Trinidad for 18 years. But this was, this was, you know, the defining feature of our family that, like, on one hand, our family, we were saving very hard. We were living very frugally in order to save enough money to pay whatever fees we had to pay. And also, as four children, we just worked. You know, we spent, like, there were a lot of parties in Trinidad, but we didn't go to them because <laughs> we were at home studying. So that was kind of how things were for us. And so, you know, we had all these years passing. And, you know, after we'd sort of done all our studying and we saved all our money, then we were like, OK, now, um, now we better find those schools. You know, how do we apply to these schools? And as I remember, there was one place in Port of Spain where you could get this information at the time. And it was the library of the US Embassy. And it was, um, it was on Marley Street in Port of Spain. It was just off the western side of the Savannah. And it was open to the public. And you could go, and you had to show security. You had to give, check your bag or something like that for security. But it was, it was, you know, it was open to the public. You could go. And there, was, um, there were these cardboard box files. And in the box files, there were the prospectuses of these American colleges. And sorry, can you still hear me? I think I'm going in and out. 
and you know in the in these booklets, you know, there were all these pictures. And I mean, I'm sure you know the kinds of pictures I'm talking about. But like, you know, these people looking very intellectual, you know. <laughs> and like having like these important conversations with their professors and, you know, these snowball fights, which was like so exotic for us, you know. And, <laughs> and then like, you know, and then there were people in these libraries and these like really high ceiling rooms and like books all around. And there's people like in this deep concentration at a desk with a little, I mean, you know, it was just, we just wanted to go there. You know, we didn't resent working hard. We wanted to work hard because we wanted to get out to that place. And, and you know, I, I'm happy to tell you that it, it all worked out and we all, we all left. And in my case, I went to Brown. And so I lived here in the U.S. for four years um, in Providence, Rhode Island. And so that was all a long time ago. So that was when I was 18 and I'm 44 now, I will admit. And... <laughs> You know, so one of the things that really stuck with me about that experience was my parents' determination. It just dogged determination to get us out. In particular, this was from my father. And, you know, I knew that it was all about, like, the oil and the economy and the recession. I knew all of that. But, you know, as I was sort of thinking back to it, I was like, you know, that just doesn't fully explain it. Like, there's more to it. And so as I was, you know, years passed, and I was kind of still thinking about this, and, um, you know, I was trying to get to the bottom of it. And so when I came to writing, I was thinking about this determination. I kind of began to, to see this family and this man. And, and I could sort of see this man. And I could see what, I could just see something inside this man. And um, so this man, Clyde, so he's the father. So he's not an educated man, but he's, he's going to do his best for his two children. So he has two boys, as Sarah Jessica said, so Peter and Paul, and they're quite different. So Peter is quite gifted, and some educated people take Clyde aside and they say, look here, you know, this child, he's really special. You need to do something about this child. And meanwhile, Paul, Paul isn't, he isn't as strong, but Clyde is trying his best to do what he can for both of them. And when the novel opens, the boys are 13 years old, and what happens is, um, um, so they've just had a break-in. So bandits have, have broken in, and they've ransacked the house, and they've tied up the family and stuff like that. So they're still sort of just trying to get their lives back together and trying to pull things back together. And, um, and Clyde comes home, and he finds that Paul, who's the weaker son, Paul has gone out, and he hasn't come home. And, you know, Clyde is kind of trying, he's like, oh, okay, sorry, you know, he'll come back. Because he's kind of trying to play strong. Because, you know, this is, this is how men have to be in, in a place like Trinidad. But he's really worried. And, you know, they, they sort of wait up and they call around the neighbors. And, you know, when it gets dark, then Clyde has to, he has to put on his shoes and he has to get the flashlight and he has to go into the bush and look for him. And this is kind of where we start. And as the story unfolds, we find out that there's an inheritance and there's, you know, the Clyde has kind of been trying to keep secret, and there are the, all these family tensions that are in the background. And later on, there is a kidnapping. And, you know, this is, I just want to say, this is a very realistic scenario in Trinidad. And, like, sometimes people get away, and sometimes they don't. And, you know, I just mentioned that because, like, the, the dilemmas that the characters face in this story are real dilemmas that are faced by real people in Trinidad. And like, I know it sounds, you know, it might sound a bit dramatic and stuff, but you know, really, this is just a story about a family. And it's a story of a father who is hell bent on doing his best for these two children. And it's about these two children who are so different, but in their own way, they're just trying so hard to live up to their father's expectations for them. Okay, I, I better stop because I know we're probably over time and you guys are tired, you've, you've sat through a lot and it's been so wonderful. And I just wanted to tell you that this is actually the very first time that I've been talking in public about this book. So it's been a real honor for me. So thank you so much. Yeah.